We are going to look this morning, as the kids are leaving, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. That is the first of our top five verses. And as we go throughout 2020, we're going to be seeking to see, and especially God's special revelation, but I want us to just keep our hearts and our eyes tuned for a couple of other things too, thin places. Will you just seek to see, just like the wise men who came to the nativity, right, that they were, they were seekers, they were searching. And every once in a while, we come to moments in our lives when we realize that we don't know everything we thought we knew, right? A few weeks ago, I fell for a scam. I won't get into all the details, it's a little embarrassing, but I fell for a scam, you know, and I, I realized when I was done through with this ordeal, it's like, man, I have so much to learn. Sometimes our relationships begin to come apart things that we thought were secure, and we say, man, I, I have so much yet to learn because I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to deal with this aspect of my life, and, and our employment, our job comes apart, and other pieces of our lives, and suddenly we're in this place where we say, man, I need to learn how to deal with this. I don't know everything that I thought I knew, and suddenly we're reminded that we're all seeking. We're all searchers on a journey, right? So I want us in this journey of 2020, as we begin a new decade, to watch for thin places. What do I mean by thin places? Well, let me describe some that I think are thin places. John Storm, sitting in my dorm room in college, praying to surrender his life to Jesus Christ for the first time, to say, God, I want to put you in charge of my life, and being there just sitting in the same room with John and watching him do this was just like I, God was present there. It was a thin place. A number of years ago now, baptizing one of my dear friends, John, out in the park in Indiana and just watching the transformation that had taken place in his life and it culminated in that baptism of his out in the park, that was a, that was a thin place for me. Watching our old neighbor, Gina, stand in front of a group of people and give her testimony of how God had changed her life as she committed herself to follow Him. That was another one of those thin places for me. So watch for thin places where you just see God's presence in a powerful way. And God sightings, a lot like thin places, but maybe a little bit different. God sightings. What do I mean by God sightings? Well, one for me recently was being kind of overwhelmed with anxiety and uncertainty about the future and just struggling a little bit, just having a stressful day because of events that happened and having my three-year-old granddaughter run to me, wrap her arms around my neck and just hug me and God just melted the stress away. I knew what was important again. I, I was content. I was so grateful for what He had given me, and my perspective was just changed in an instant. And you say, well, that's what grandkids do, but ultimately I think God did that through my grandchild, right? It's a God sighting. And we see other th events in our lives and things that happen like that. Seeing our preschool struggle for a year and a half we prayed to get to 20 kids. Lord, just bring us 20 kids. Now Amanda and the rest of the team tell me that they're getting calls every week, sometimes daily, and we don't have enough room for all the kids to bring into our preschool. That's a God sighting. Only God did that. One more. Singing like we just did. Maybe one particular song for you, but there are moments when I can sense that the Holy Spirit is singing to the Heavenly Father, and I'm this conduit, and it just, it breaks me, 
right? It just brings tears to my eyes and it moves my heart because I know the Holy Spirit is welling up in me, giving glory to his heavenly Father because that's what the Trinity is about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is this incredible communion and sometimes we get caught up in that. And a lot of times that happens for me in worship when I sing with the team as they lead us into God's presence. That's a God sighting. So will you just be sensitive as you enter into 2020 to watch for those thin places, those God sightings, and most of all, God's revelation of himself through this, what we call a special revelation, that he's written this book so that we can understand who he is. Matthew, cha Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, if you've got your Bibles open or you've got your Bible on your phone, you can look at this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen too. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, I want you to see it up on the screen. It says, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Some of you maybe heard that verse before. It's a beautiful verse. Sometimes I've seen people, you know, post it on Facebook or something like that, and they will remove the first word because, you know, it doesn't sound so smooth when you take out the first word or if you leave the first word in, it doesn't read as smooth when you're just trying to isolate that verse. And they just say, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. And it rolls a little better that way. And we do that a lot with how we use Scripture. We sometimes take it out of its context. Let's just pull it out because we're going to spend half the message this morning talking about the first word, but. It's a conjunction, right? A con in this context, it's a conjunction. And this conjunction tells us that there's something that came before that's important for understanding what comes next. You follow me? Those of you that remember your... your grammar, your English from high school, right? There, there's a conjunction there that says that's contrasting something that came before. The but says there's a contrast here. So what we just got done saying is now contrasted with what we're about to say. So putting the kingdom of God first and His righteousness is contrasted with what came before. Well, what came before? Well, before we look at what comes right before, I want to put it even in the bigger context, okay? So, who said this? Well, Matthew wrote it. And Matthew was a follower of Jesus Christ, a former tax collector who follow, followed Jesus, and he wrote his gospel especially to the Jewish people, okay? So, that's a little bit of the context, but who's, who's he recording here? Who's, whose words are he, is he writing down? He's writing down Jesus' words. Jesus said this. Jesus, the Messiah. He is the Messiah from the Old Testament that the Old Testament talked about. He is the fulfillment of all of the promises in the Old Testament. That's part of what we learn as we study Scripture. And this particular Matthew 6 is part of a larger section of Scripture, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. All three chapters are called the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon in history ever preached. And so the Sermon on the Mount is this little passage that we're looking at this morning is nestled in the middle of this Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount begins with uh, blessings that describe the kingdom. You've heard of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, and so on and so forth. There's these repeated blessings at the introduction of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus begins to describe what the kingdom is all about through these blessings that He gives. Then there are laws that redefine the kingdom, what it means and what it feels like and what it is to live in the kingdom. Because Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't kill. But I say to you, if you hate somebody in your heart, if you're harboring bitterness towards somebody, you've already killed them. So Jesus raises the bar for what it means to obey the law in the new kingdom. 
in the kingdom that he is inaugurating. He said, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you lust after someone in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So Jesus is saying it's not just about the outward behavior, it's about the inward attitude of your heart that makes all the difference in my kingdom. Enduring relationships, he talks about divorce. He talks about how in the kingdom, we're going to hold on to each other. He talks about a new definition of love. Because he says, you know, in the past, you've loved people who could, who could love you in return. But if you live in my kingdom, if you follow me, then you love even those who don't love you back. You love your enemies. You love the people that it's hard to love. And he says, in my kingdom, the poor are going to be taken care of. Not with big flashy cameras and everybody knowing what you're doing, but you just quietly going about your business, caring for those who don't can't care for themselves. He says, that's what my kingdom is about. And then he says, he has two sections right before this on prayer, and the Lord's prayer is defined there and outlined. And then he talks about fasting, that in my kingdom, prayer is going to be foundational. Fasting, the disciplines that connect you with God are going to be foundational in the kingdom that I'm bringing. Okay, so that's all about the but. That's a little hint at what comes before. That's the context. And when we look at God's Word, there's this principle that I think I skipped over on the slide, but they can jump back to it. For every text, consider the context. Okay? For every, if you're following along your outline, write this down. Even if you're not, this is a really important stuff to write down. Even if you don't normally take notes, write this down so that when you come back and you're just reading the Bible, you remember some of these principles. You say, okay, for every text, there's a context. And it's important that when I read one text, that I put it in the greater context, okay? Now, what is the more immediate context? As we look at Matthew chapter 6, what's the immediate context? Well, let's read it. And I'm going to put it up on the screen for those of you who don't have your Bibles open. It starts at verse 25. Actually, I'm going to read verse 24. I don't have that up on the screen, but let me read verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Then verse 25, therefore... See, there's a conjunction, so what, that's why I read verse 24, because that's the therefore. You can't serve both God and money. You can't have two masters. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not? much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Here's our verse, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you were looking up on the screen, maybe you noticed how many times this passage mentions worry. Some translations talk about anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety. Don't worry. I love it that in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, this is near the center, that Jesus has talked about what the kingdom is going to be like, these blessings, and then He's raised the bar with these laws, and then right in the middle, He wants to, he wants to say, don't worry. 
don't be anxious. Because if Jesus were standing here today looking you in the eye, He would want you to know that you don't need to worry. You don't need to be anxious. You don't need to carry the burdens that we so readily try to pick up and carry in our anxiousness, right? Over and over again in this passage, it says, don't worry. Why do you worry? You can't add a day to your life by worry. In fact, just the opposite. Psychiatrists say that the more you worry, the more you take days off of your life, right? It does things to your body. In fact, one in five adults suffer from a diagnosable, generalized anxiety with debilitating symptoms. One in five. Anxiety is a huge part of the world that we live in. Some people get a, you know, it's amazing that our bodies are so fearfully and wonderfully made that when we have some anxieties or uncertainties or fears that there are chemicals that are released in our bodies. Endorphins, adrenaline, all sorts of these things. And some people get addicted to these things, these, uh, you know, the, the base jumpers go to the edge of a mountain, put some wings on and, and dive off the mountain or skydivers or whatever these amazing things that people do. Now, because they love the feeling of the endorphins and the adrenaline that gets injected into their system when they do crazy things. But when that's sustained, when we experience anxiety and uncertainty on a regular basis, it does damage to who we are. That our fears have ripple impact on our physical bodies. And, and it begins to break down our bodies because we're not supposed to be having these chemicals released all the time when we're constantly struggling with anxiety. I remember when I was just a young boy, I had these repeated episodes where I couldn't catch my breath. And, I, you know, I told my mom and I was, it scared me and it bothered me and I just was like, what's going on? Why can't I catch my breath? So mom eventually took me to the doctor just to make sure everything was okay, and the doctor said, physically, he's fine. And he said to me and my mom, I can give you a placebo. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't old enough to know what a placebo was. But he said, well, it's basically a pill that does nothing, but because you're taking something, you think that it's going to help you. I was like, well, why didn't you just give me the pill and not tell me that? right? It would have been much easier if you had just given me something. And he said, well, do you want the placebo? I'm like, no, I'll just get a roll of Smarties and, you know, imagine that I'm taking medicine, right? And eventually it went away, but it was just, it was just anxiety. It was just uncertainty and fear. And it's interesting, but I, I never dealt with that again until just two or three years ago when all of a sudden I would wake up in the middle of the night, and this happened two or three times, and I, I could not get my breath. And I knew physically there was nothing wrong with me, but I just, I couldn't breathe, and I felt like I was suffocating. And I'd get up, and I just had to, had to pray and talk to God, and I was looking all over for my roll of Smarties, you know, just so I could have my... But nothing, you know, your mind just does this powerful thing with anxiety that we fear. And we sometimes are obsessed and consumed with the uncertainty and the fear. And a lot of things in our lives can contribute to this, but the bottom line is this. Matthew 6, ultimately says, don't worry. And when we do struggle with worry, that at the heart of it is that we don't trust God. You know, when I, when I get anxious, I'm trying to control things that only God can control. I'm trying to deal with life on my own without faith in God. That's, that's at the heart of it. That doesn't mean that that's the answer to every problem with anxiety because uh, medicine and counseling can help a lot with anxiety and we should, we should look, seek to find those things when we have struggles with anxiety. 
But when, we're, when we worry, Jesus is letting us know that ultimately at the core, it's, it's that we don't trust God. And that we need to learn what it means to trust God. And there are lots of things that contribute to this in our lives. But how do we get to the place where we learn what it means to trust God? The next biblical principle that I want to highlight is this. The Bible is not a string of individual pearls, but rather a chain of linked thoughts. Let me say that again. The Bible is not a string of individual pearls, but rather a chain of linked thoughts. So often, in fact, I heard a message in my brother's church this past weekend when we went to church in Missouri, and oh man, he uh, started with one passage, said that was his text, and by the end of the message, I think there were 15 or 20 other passages that he'd referred to, and I could not make heads or tails of how they all fit together. But he had an outline, uh, you know, that was dealing with a certain topic, and all of these were kind of supporting texts. They were these little pearls that stood individually to support the, the text that he, or the, the idea that he was trying to get across. And I don't mean to be critical, but it was, it was, I, it, it, struck me as exactly that, that they were individual pearls rather than a chain, you know, links in a chain that all fit together. Because see, you isolate a pearl, it's still valuable, right? But if you take a link out of the chain, it's really useless. It's only helpful to you if it's all together in the chain. And let me just give you the biggest part of the chain of this book, okay? Creation, fall, covenant community, redemption, and return. That's the big chain. And there are lots of other links in the chain along the way, but as we look at this passage, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we want to keep that big picture in mind of those big links of the chain and how this fits into that creation. God created all things good, that this world was was not created with all this mess that we deal with. That's not what God intended. That's so important for us to understand. Otherwise, we, we kind of blame God for the mess that we find ourselves in, and it's not His fault. God created it good. We rebelled against Him, and that's the fall. Then God established the covenant community, Israel, that He separated out a people to Himself to build a relationship with them and through them so that the whole world would know that He still cared, that He still loved them, and that He was still working out a plan for them to come back to Him, to be in relationship with Him, and that's redemption in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is redemption. And finally, the last piece, the fifth piece of the chain, the links in the chain, is that he's going to come back someday. And he's going to set everything right when he returns. That someday Jesus is going to return and he's going to set all things right. And that's the the broad strokes of the plot line that we live within. That's the plot line within which we read every passage of Scripture, that we understand that. So ultimately, when we read Scripture that way, we understand that we don't have to worry, that God's in control. He's been in control from the beginning. He's working things out, and someday He's going to set all things right, and and He's in control of that. And when we can keep those things in mind, we we don't have to worry anymore. But what do we do? We tend to think, oh, man, if if I could just get that raise life would be better. If I could just land that big client for the company, life would be so much better. Or for me, you know, every Monday uh, they count the offering and I get a little email and I I watch the email and I want to know, what was the offering Sunday? Can we pay our bills this week? You know, it's like, and, and I'm like this, right? I'm like this, depending on how the offering was. You get an evaluation from your boss, maybe. And you worry about that evaluation. How are you going to do? You know, does your boss notice you? Does he value what you do? And if you get a negative evaluation, you're like this. And if you get a good one, you're like this. And you get the idea, right? I mean, there's so many of these things. 
and emotionally, we, we live like this, right? At least all too often I do. I live like this. I don't live in the place where I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is in control, that all the little things that threaten to put me up and down like this, he, he says this, people who don't know God at all, that's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. We don't, that word pagan isn't a very friendly word, but ultimately it's, it's people that don't have a relationship with God. That's how they live. They live like this. You live like this. You live knowing that God is in control and that you are not. And that gives you an incredible serenity and peace resting in Him. Even though the circumstances of your life are always going to go like this, there's always going to be pain, there's always going to be joys that bring you up and down, but you know in the midst of it the serenity and the peace of knowing that you can trust a holy God. Okay, third one is this. The third biblical principle is this or the third principle for reading the Bible, is that each passage is therefore connected to the main story of the Bible, which is centered in the good news of the life and death of Jesus and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is, the gospel. So each Bible passage is therefore connected to the main story of the Bible, which is centered in the gospel. Every passage you read in this book points to the person of Jesus Christ. If you want to restate it that way, you can state it that way. Every passage, every text in this book points to the person of Jesus Christ. Let me give you this quote this, from Blaise Pascal. He said this, The greatness of man is so evident that, even, that it is even proved by his wretchedness. For who is unhappy at not being a king except a deposed king? Stay with me, all right? I know that's a little out there, a little hard to absorb initially it was for me. But here's the point, that God created us to be stewards of His kingdom, the lead servants in His household, in charge of all the things except for what the owner's in charge of, all right? We wanted more. What God gave us to be in charge of was not enough for us, and we wanted more. We had to have more. In our pride and in our arrogance, we bucked at what He gave us to be in charge of, and we reached for more. We wanted to be in charge of what was sin and what wasn't sin. We were not satisfied to let Him delineate what was right and wrong. We wanted that, and we still do. We as Blaise Pascal says, we are unhappy at not being kings because we're deposed. We've been deposed, right? We've been in that place where we're reaching for more. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and they reached for more. God said, don't eat the fruit. And they said, we're going to decide what fruit we can eat and can't eat. We're going to set our own boundaries. And all of a sudden, messiness pain, suffering was introduced into God's good creation. Does that make sense? That we keep reaching for more and that ultimately peace comes when we rest in God's control. If we can get to the place where we stop trying to control the things that we were never intended to control, we experience God's peace. And we're able to let go of the worry and the anxiety that plagues us. I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make here in the Sermon on the Mount. Let me finish with this. That was all about the but, right? How this passage fits into the rest of God's Word and how it fits into Matthew 6. Now let's look at a couple of other words before we finish. The, the next one is seek. Seek first. Seeking has to do with the mind and the will. Verse 26 and 28, if you still have your Bibles open, it says, look at the birds of the air. Look. Verse 32 says, run after. Right? That's the will. What are we looking at and what are we running after? 
What is it that you seek? Jesus says that we should run after something that we should not run after something that's not ours. That we should run after what is His, His kingdom, His righteousness. Don't mistake that by thinking that you have to run after your own righteousness. Because ultimately, if you try to run after your own righteousness, you, you'll fail. Right? You, we can't measure up to God's standard. That's part of what he's saying earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, that he sets the bar so high for obedience that we listen to it and say, man, I can't begin to, to reach that bar. How do I love my enemies? How do I not lust in my thoughts? How do I not harbor anger to people who wrong me when I suffer injustice? And, and the bar is so high that when we look at it, we say, I'm broken. And it drives us to the grace of Jesus Christ. Then we begin to seek not our own righteousness or our own kingdom, but we begin to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And the only way we can attain that is through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because then, when we understand and we embrace and we surrender our lives to the grace of Jesus Christ, then His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Then when God looks at us, He doesn't look at all of the wrongs that we have done, but He looks at us and He sees the grace of Jesus Christ in us. And we can begin to live our lives from a place that is empowered by grace, not by our own will, not by our, our ability to do what's right, but by the grace of God living in us, transforming who we are. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is so easy for us to try to control the things that we cannot control, and it produces all kinds of anxiety and worry in our lives. I pray this morning that we would lay that down, that we would take one more step of surrender to say, Lord, it's not about what I want. It's not about the things that I want to control, but it's about relinquishing control and surrendering to what we were always intended to know, that you are the one who is in control. It's about your kingdom and it's about your righteousness. Lord, when we do that, everything else falls into place. Everything else will be added unto us. Lord, I pray that we would seek your kingdom more than anything else in this world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.